Every year, usually during our graduation ceremonies, UBC has the honor of bestowing honorary degrees upon individuals who, in the opinion of the university community, have fit the criteria of excellence and eminence in their chosen field. Essie Adujan exemplifies these characteristics, and it is our pleasure to grant her an honorary degree. Essie Adujan is the Canadian-born daughter of Ghanaian immigrants and has been described by the Globe and Mail as the most ambitious novelist in Canada. A graduate of the University of Victoria and Johns Hopkins University, she is renowned for crafting thoughtful and sweeping historical novels that deal with the legacies of race and displacement, explore the impact of history on the present, and illuminate complicated truths about race and belonging. Her best-selling work has garnered extensive national and international recognition. Her literary debut, The Second Life of Samuel Tyne, borrows insightfully on her parents' experiences and was shortlisted for the 2005 Hurston Wright Legacy Award. Her second novel, Half-Blood Blues, was published in 2011 and shortlisted for four of the most prestigious prizes for English language fiction, the Mann Booker Prize, Scotiabank Giller Prize, Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, and the Governor General's Award for English Language Fiction. In addition to the Giller Prize, the book also won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award. Her most recent novel, Washington Black, was also shortlisted for the 2018 Man Booker and the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, as well as the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and the International Dublin Literary Award. Notably, Washington Black again took the Giller Prize, making her one of only three authors to have twice earned that distinction. We are pleased to also note that she has been selected to deliver the 2021 CBC Massey Lectures in recognition of her contributions to the cultural fabric of Canada and to public discourse on race relations. We are pleased to confer the degree of Doctor of Letters honoris causa upon Essie Adujan. It now gives me great pleasure to ask Dr. Adujan to say a few words. Chancellor Point, President Ono, faculty, distinguished virtual guests, and finally, to each of you, the ambitious, hardworking, and talented graduates of the class of 2021. Congratulations, what an achievement. It's an honor for me to get to address you today. I'd like to begin by telling you about a painting. In 1918, in the wake of the Spanish flu epidemic, the world began to shift. Change had been long and slow in coming. In Vienna, the artist Egon Schiele started work on a painting called The Family. He had a visionary worldview. He had always embraced change and been criticized for it, called out of step with his time. Now, his wife lay ill and he made a portrait of her in a healthier state, painting himself beside her and a baby nestled in her lap. The image was a fantasy. In reality, neither Sheila nor his pregnant wife would survive the flu epidemic. Sheila was born in a small Austrian village late in the 19th century, the son of a station master whose greatest hope was that his son would also be a station master. Sheila did love trains, but what he loved was not their engineering as his father had hoped, but the great smoking spectacle of them crossing the darkened fields. Sheila would take out his sketch pads and draw. We may desire to create change, but how to start? Is change even possible? Sheila was 28 when he began work on the family. He had a frantic, combative energy, despite having already completed many works. He hated so much of what he saw in the world around him, the rigid moral codes of Vienna, the wealth inequity, 
and he too felt a helplessness in the face of it. What Sheila could see was what others were not yet ready to see. His country's marginalization of women, its privileging of money and rank above personal freedoms, its scorn for difference. But his was a gift to depict life with honesty, to paint people in their most vulnerable states. And this, he came to understand, was the work that he could do to show that society was not a concept, but the living, breathing people who make it up. His portraits were intense, the figures in them sharp boned, raw. It was an ugliness that shocked people into a deeper understanding of their neighbors and themselves. An ugliness that reminds us that no matter where we find ourselves in the social hierarchy, we all share in the vulnerability of the body and the mind and in the miraculous ability, even when it seems least possible to change. This past year has seen so much chaos and upheaval. So much of our talk has been about change. Lockdowns have forced us to look directly at the world that we have made for ourselves. We've been given an opportunity to decide what matters to us most. Some have called this a norm shattering moment, a time when we've been so shaken from routine that we might actually try to do things differently. But change is not a given. There have been many cases in the past where great disruptions have failed to shift anything at all. What will ultimately make the difference is you. Today, you graduate. Yours is a world altered as we've not seen since Schiller's era. Ask yourselves, what would you like the world of the next 50 years to become? It may be that this is a question that takes you a long time to answer. Don't worry about this. Bewilderment is natural and a part of the process because nothing will turn out as you expect it to. There are ways the world will seek to diminish you to shrink you, to insist, as it insisted to Sheila, that your vision doesn't matter. To this I say, no, do not allow yourself to be made small. Your voice matters, it is necessary. It is the beginning of engagement and engagement is the only means that we have to confirm and keep confirming our shared humanity. What a simple thing it is to shut yourself down to forget that you are dealing with people who are as hopeful, as grief-filled, as vulnerable as yourself. This is what Sheila hoped to convey with his paintings. It is the work that the arts and the humanities can do to emphasize and remind us of these human connections. For it is surely empathy that is needed now more than anything as we venture forward in our difficult times, which is to say, we need to remind ourselves to seek out the human in others, to remind ourselves of the ways in which our stories are the same, and also of all of the sad and epic, negligible ways in which they aren't. This is the beginning of understanding. This is the beginning of healing. The family is the saddest of paintings. It represents everything that Sheila lost but it is also an intensely hopeful one. In depicting the family that he did not get to have, the painting is an act of resistance against loss, a way of cherishing what one loves most, a way finally of changing one's fate. From the imperfect world around him, Sheila created the world as he wanted it to be. You can do this too. In fact, you must. Whether your vocation is art, law, environmental studies, social justice, commit to tackling it seriously. Ask yourself if you like what you are seeing, and if not, how you can bring things closer to your vision. This is your world now, and whether it is worsened or made better is truly up to you. And that is an exciting thing. I want to congratulate you again 
on your first day of remaking the world. My advice for uh, people graduating today is to take yourself utterly seriously and take uh, whatever it is that you are devoting your life to, uh, whether you know whether it's issues of, of social justice or um, you know environmentalism, um, something else that spurs you. You're an artist. Um, you know, to, to totally devote yourself to that and to not let yourself off the hook and to not take half measures. I think um, just having, you know, had a conversation with a friend recently who felt as though, you know, she just, it took her a long time to kind of settle into something. And she said she just always wished that she had been forced to stick with something uh, long enough to to sort of, you know, make something larger of it. And you know, it's hard uh, when you're faced with failure, uh, as I myself know, um, you know, to, to keep going. Uh, but you should keep going if you think what you're doing is is worthwhile and necessary. And, and I would argue for you on your behalf that it is. Uh, so take yourself seriously and, and commit yourself and don't be put off by um, by failure.